Uh, back during the early years of aviation, people thought, you know, the sky is really big and aircraft are pretty small, so they probably won't crash into each other. Uh, that is until 1956. There was a mid-air collision over the Grand Canyon between United Airlines and TWA. This resulted in a press frenzy, congressional hearings, and ultimately the establishment of the FAA in 1958. And with the establishment of the FAA, it brought a number of improvements to uh, the strategic separation of aircraft and the tactical separation of aircraft. So for an example, depending on what altitude uh, depending on what direction you're flying, you fly at different altitude layers. And uh, we also have air traffic controllers who rely upon ground-based radars to vector aircraft around each other. So that significantly improved the safety of the airspace, but there were still these mid-air collisions. The one on the left uh, happened in 1978. Both of these were in California over San Diego, 144 fatalities. A press photographer actually caught this as it happened on film. This led Congress to realize that uh, we needed to develop an onboard system for aircraft that directs the pilots directly how to maneuver to avoid collision. And this resulted in the TCAS program that Steve mentioned. Then uh, there was a mid-air collision over Cerritos, California, 82 fatalities just a few miles from Disneyland, and Congress realized that they actually needed to mandate this system that was under development. And uh, uh, by the year 2000, most of the world uh, adopted TCAS as a standard collision avoidance system on all large uh, commercial transport aircraft. So TCAS works like this. It has a surveillance system. It detects and tracks intruders. And it passes the sensor information over to some decision-making logic. And uh, here's a, li a little um, snippet of the actual code there. This advisory logic det determines whether to produce an advisory and what advisory to recommend to the pilots. And this gets passed on to the display. So any guesses as to how many pages of pseudocode is required to specify this logic? 10,000. OK, that's, that's, a, that's a much better guess than the guess I got from the other computer science faculty at the faculty lunch. They looked at the slide. and. They counted up three. And uh, so a lot of computer scientists <laughs> don't really have a full appreciation for how hard aerospace problems are. Um, before I tell you the, the answer, I'm going to show you this little snippet from uh, Instagram. So that, uh, it says, they use coding and algorithms so the drones don't crash into each other. And then someone commented, if going to crash into each other, don't. Uh, if only it were that easy. Um, and then someone with like the most ridiculous username ever uh, commented, uh, as a robotics major, I can confirm this is 100% how coding works. And they're lying about at least one thing here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's way more complicated than, than that. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of two pages from the specification, RTCA DO 185B. It's uh, 1,799 pages, 440 of it is pseudocode. And uh, the, the, the challenge here is that there are so many different edge cases that you have to worry about in order to provide the level of safety that we expect from commercial air transport. It's really easy to write down maybe half a page of code that works about 99% of the time. But getting it to uh, a level of safety around uh, 10 to the minus 9 probability of collision uh, it requires a lot of effort. Uh, so to illustrate uh, the, the challenge with TCAS, I'll talk about this 2002 Uberlingen collision. But before I do that, I would really want to emphasize that TCAS represents a major success story uh, for the FAA. Um, since TCAS was deployed, there have been exactly zero mid-air collisions over the United States involving TCAS. So TCAS is not required equipment on small general aviation aircraft like I fly. Um, they, they don't meet the minimum weight and passenger requirements. And for small general aviation aircraft, there are mid-air collisions every month to every other month. You don't hear about it because they're, they're so common. So in the 2002 Uberlingen collision, we have Bashkirian Airlines. It's a Russian jetliner. Incidentally, it's carrying a few dozen Russian school children. 
um, uh, on their way to uh, Barcelona. And on the right, we have a DHL cargo jet. So this is 2002. TCAS has been mandated uh, worldwide. TCAS tells the Russians to climb and DHL to descend. Uh, unfortunately, and, and if they followed that, everything would have been just fine. But unfortunately, at that same time, an air traffic controller instructed the, uh, the Russians to descend. And so you have this situation where you have the automation telling you to do one thing in a, in a robot voice, and then a human voice telling you to do the opposite. And the human voice is based on radar data, uh, which has a lower update rate and isn't uh, directly coordinating with the other aircraft. So uh, they ended up following the, the human voice and uh, they ended up colliding with each other. Um, it, it was a super tragic uh, incident uh, for a number of reasons. In fact, um, the, the, uh, one of the fathers uh, uh, of some of the kids, on, uh, two of the kids on board that aircraft, uh, his wife was also on board and he couldn't deal with the loss and he actually went and found the air traffic controller in his uh, apartment and then stabbed him to death with a pocket knife in front of his kids. So lots of, lots of things went wrong here. Uh, but what we would have liked to have seen from TCAS is for the DHL cargo jet to, to infer that the pilots on board the other aircraft were not following their advisory and then reverse that descend to a climb. TCAS has the capability of doing uh, these kinds of reversals, but there was one line of code uh, in that document that prohibited reversals in that particular geometry. If things were slightly different, then a reversal would have been triggered and everything would have been okay. So I started at Lincoln Lab in 2006, and I, my background is in artificial intelligence. My thesis work involved uh, Markov decision processes, or MDPs, and, and POMDPs which I'll mention shortly. The idea of a Markov decision process has been around for a long time, since at least the 1950s with Richard Bellman. The idea is really s simple. How, how many of you have heard of Markov decision processes before? Oh, that's great, but still not, maybe a slight majority. Um, it really ought to be taught in elementary school. Here's the idea. We have a set of states. I'm just showing three states here. I numbered them one through three. And the state of the world captures the relevant variables that uh, uh, that define the problem. So in the case of um, driverless cars, maybe you keep track of the positions of the cars around you, their velocities, and so forth. And then uh, given the current state that you're in, you have different actions available to you. Here I'm just showing A or B. Maybe that's like turn left or turn right. And then depending on what state you're in and what action you take, you end up in some new state with some probability distribution. What you want to do is accumulate as much reward as possible over time. You can see that some of those transitions are annotated with like plus one or minus 10. You want to maximize your accumulation of this reward. Okay, it's a very nice general formulation of a sequential decision-making problem under uncertainty. There's a generalization of this to the case where you don't know exactly the state of the world. And this is really important in contexts like autonomous driving where you may have sensor occlusions or sensor noise or sensor failures, but you can use Bayes' rule, which is a standard statistical rule, to update your inference about what state you might be in. Since we're uncertain, we use a probability distribution. But otherwise, the idea is exactly the same. You want to behave in a way that accumulates as much reward as possible over time. So what we did was we took that POMDP formulation and uh, we formulated the problem of collision avoidance as a POMDP and then solved for the optimal policy using a process known as dynamic programming. And I thought this would be kind of like a fun side project for like a couple weeks. Um, and I didn't think it would really compete with TCAS because, you know, really, really smart people at MIT, Lincoln Lab, and MITRE Corporation, and elsewhere have been working on TCAS for, for decades. But it turns out that it worked really well. So it provided both a safety benefit and it also reduced the alert rate significantly. 
So it wasn't enough to just say, oh, well, it, it performed really well in simulation and it's the optimal solution to a POMDP. We needed to go through a, a very rigorous safety and operational analysis. Um, so one of the most important components of this is uh, building up a representative statistical model of the airspace. And then we can s uh, sample from that statistical model and run uh, tens of billions of simulations to confirm that we get the safety benefit that, that we hope for. We can also play back uh, recorded radar tracks. We can apply formal methods and uh, Dorsa will elaborate on uh, applications of formal methods to um, other decision-making systems. We've also looked at stress testing. We built up many models of um, specific scenarios like closely spaced parallel, parallel runway operations. And we also developed uh, an area of um, adaptive stress testing, which aims to find the most likely failure conditions for any kind of system. Uh, also, part of the safety and operational analysis was, uh, was a series of flight tests. And uh, let me tell you, few things are more exciting than being on a large aircraft, flying directly at another large aircraft, and hoping that this POMDP business works out. <laughs> um, and it did, and it's, it's, uh, they're, um, they're, drafting, well, actually, they're done with the draft of the minimum operational performance standards uh, for this new system called ACAS-X. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to the next speaker.